without serious bipartisan efforts to implement comprehensive criminal justice reform, we spent time debating the merits of the sweet potato. To be clear, we have nothing against sweet potatoes and discovered that this was an effort spearheaded by Alabama students as a class project to learn about the legislative process. House Democrats applaud that effort and give credit to our colleagues across the aisle for helping students learn about how bills become a law. However, it doesn't change the fact that there are much more serious issues that deserve the legislature's time and attention given the challenges that we all face. While Alabamans are still recovering from COVID-19, from this huge pandemic, and small businesses are closing or struggling to just stay afloat, and people are trying to figure out how to feed their families or get health care while they look for new jobs, we spent an hour debating the merits of the sweet potato. Of course, we don't necessarily have a problem with the, the idea that Alabama should have an official vegetable. That's not the point at all. The point is that we feel that there are far more pressing issues that require the legislature's attention. We feel that many of the bills that we have introduced have far more importance than the status of the sweet potato. But sadly, they face considerable delay and being put on the legislative calendar. House Democrats, despite being cloctured or stopped during debate on several bills, believe that the people have a right to hear substantive and meaningful dialogue on the laws that are being considered by their elected representatives. As we have said on the House floor, we may be currently in the minority, but we still deserve to have our voices heard and the people of Alabama expect their legislators to engage in debate, thoughtful debate, and to carefully consider the bills that are presented. The House of Representatives should not just be a rubber stamp, nor should we rush the process of carrying out the important business of the people of Alabama. Having said that, we'll turn our attention to Representative Jackson, who will give us an overview of legislation and policy proposals that we as Democrats have introduced based on our agenda. We presented it at the beginning of the session and you need to hear where those bills are now. Representative Jackson. Thank you, Representative Coleman. Well, I don't really understand how the people of this state feel about the sweet potato issue. But I do know how they feel about the more important issues of voting rights, racism, and injustice. That's why I introduced two bills last session and again this session as it relates to early voting. House Bill 114, which will allow an early voting day six days before the election. And the second bill is House Bill 197, which will provide for no excuse absentee voting. Both of these bills have strong support from the people of, of our state, but they have not even got a hearing in the, the committee. No legislative process for the people who wants it the most. Another very critical issue that we should address today is the governor's proposal for private company to build prisons in Alabama. As we all are aware, the Department of Justice has threatened serious action and federal in interventions to our state, and it doesn't immediately correct its multiple problems with the acceptable and yet perversive in the Alabama Department of Corrections. And we're still under court order because there's mistreatment in our Justice Department. We are not doing what is proper and what is right toward those who have been incarcerated. House Democrats have said that from the start that it's going to take more than bricks and mortar to solve these systemic and cultural problems. You know, I, I, the people on the other side, people in the majority party, they, 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 they talk about council culture. 
They want they want to cancel democracy. Mm. They want to take away the process of persons voting and having to elect their officials. Again, we all realize that we are currently need more capacity in our prisons. But building prisons is not going to resolve the problem. It's how we deal with the inca incarcerations of individuals and citizens. See, we need to get away from three strikes and you out, mandatory sentences. We need to reform our justice and when it comes to checking the violence and stopping a person from having a, a tail light missing. Mm -hmm. House Democrats do not believe that we can simply build on our, our way out of this crisis. And I mean building our way out is putting up buildings, bricks and mortar. While it is clear that our physical prison structures must be repaired or replaced, we cannot stop there. We must examine evidence-based comprehensive solutions and including community-based treatment, supervision, alternatives to what both cost efficiency and more effective reducing recidivism and violence within our prisons. Addressing this, this symptom, the symptomatic <laughs> issues that increase our livelihood and incarceration, true prison reform includes more serious discussions than consideration of frankly long overdue reforms to build uh, probations and expungement and sentencing guidelines that currently resembles wealth-based incarceration. And we have a pipeline from school to prisons. That's right. We need to correct that. That's why we are happy today when Senate Bill 117 carried the House by Representative England passed with bipartisan support and will be headed to the governor's desk. It is a bill that further designs and defines and expands expungement for people who have served time and time and working hard to find employment and move forward with their lives. See that particular spot on their resume keeps them from moving forward. House Democrats support applying technical violators reform to all parolees and probationers. Further, we support applying habitual offenders and, and drug trafficking reforms retroactively. Marijuana decriminalization deserves open discussion and honest consideration of a, a adequate and ill-defined laws from the drug wars that was put on by the Reagan years. And, and that's a wall that we have lost and continue to fight. It costs millions to taxpayers, devastating lives and communities. There's little point in building and leasing brand new buildings and expensive prisons if we don't address the serious underlying issues. The same type of abuse will simply occur again but in a different building. When addressing is not the issue, and it's not the answer, we must go to the core of the problem that is changing the way that we police in this state and change the way we treat our citizens. We should uphold them, empower them, rather than oppress and suppress their opportunities to increase. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Representative Jackson and his passion. One of the, the stories that I, I love, and I don't know if, if people even know um, what he has done for the state of Alabama. And in our fight as Democrats, we have to use the rules and the tools in order to get our voices to be heard. And one night, Representative Jackson asked that a bill be read in length. That bill took 13 hours to read. And Representative Jackson stood in that well for 13 hours, didn't allow any of us to come and relieve him. And he is a true fighter and a true champion for the citizens of the state of Alabama. Now I'd like to turn my attention to one of my mentors, um, Representative Warren, who will give us an update on the session 
and legislative priorities. She is the biggest child advocate that we have in the Alabama legislature and I'm proud to serve with her. Representative Warren. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Representative Coleman. First, I'd like to point out that this week is Black Maternal Health Week. In Alabama, this is especially important given the high incidence of infant mortality and the racial health disparities that exist in our state. This is why House Democrats continue to fight to expand Medicaid, especially for economically disadvantaged pregnant women who desperately need prenatal care and health care during pregnancy and after their children are born. How we care for pregnant mothers and their babies should be indicative of our core values as Alabamians. Though we have made some progress, Alabama still has some of the highest infant and maternal mortality rates in the nation. First and foremost, we must enhance access to critical maternal health care services for new and expected mothers by extending care for mothers up to one year after giving birth, especially those in rural communities who travel long distances to see pediatricians and OBGYN. In addition, we have a duty to better prepare mothers and protect their infants by improving access to maternal health care, nutrition, and necessary screenings, as well as enhancing public awareness on dangers related to sleep safety, substance abuse, postpartum depression, and domestic violence. It is high time that we fund research into the health risks facing Alabama mothers, especially those of color who are dying at exponentially high rates. To address these issues, Representative Laura Hall has sponsored House Bill 468, which would extend the period that a pregnant woman could receive Medicaid services from 60 days after childbirth to one year. This will help ensure that both the mother and the baby get the care they need and we believe this will help reduce the high rate of infant mortality in the state of Alabama. Of course, House Democrats believe that something must be done immediately to help the hundreds of thousands in Alabama who simply don't have access to health care or insurance. This is why our colleague, Representative Mary Moore, has introduced House Bill 432 which would expand Medicaid. It's a common sense move that would not only save lives, but make sense economically in that it will create jobs and ensure that we don't have to close more rural hospitals. Providing universal access to affordable maternal and infant health care is a great start. But House Democrats also believe that fully funding quality early childhood education is the key to putting Alabama children on the right track in school, work, and life. Strong, well-rounded pre-K programs offer our young people an increasing essential start to their academic careers. The problem is not all of our kids are afforded the opportunity for pre-K. From early literacy initiatives to STEM activities, to expose to foreign languages, to art and music, strong pre-K programs are the building blocks for lifelong learning. In addition, expanding cradle to pre-K programs for children and families in need as well as those that help to identify young people with unique challenges and provide access to specialized instruction early on, will help to close the achievement gap 
in low income communities. That is why I sponsored House Bill 208, which would ensure that all of Alabama's children complete kindergarten before being admitted to the first grade. This is practical, common sense legislation that will put our children on an early path towards success and achievement. During these times of COVID-19, we have kids who've been out of school since March. In Alabama, we have more than 5,000 students who have not been contacted during mm -hmm. this period of time. Mm -hmm. So we all know if we don't build this foundation strong when we start, by the time they get to third grade, they will truly fail and have to be retained in the third grade. So I encourage that we continue to fight for kindergarten for all of our children in the state of Alabama. So we will continue to fight for the people of Alabama during the remainder of this session and beyond. I, along with my fellow House Democrats, understand the people's priorities because we took the time to listen. And we'll continue our efforts to move Alabama from the bottom of the list to the very top where we belong. Thank you. Thank you. I told you she is an advocate for children. Um, and every time I know when I talk to her and um, we're talking about the children of Alabama, she's also thinking about her two grandbabies that she constantly fights for. I am going off script because I see um, our wage equity person that is in the room. And I just really wish Adeline Clark would come up and just at least stand with us. When I think about um, what she has done from Mobile um, for trying to to really close that wage gap between men and women, equal pay for equal work. Yes. And she's yes. the champion and I wanna thank you so much. As a matter of fact, um, actually, um, I, I don't know if people know that out of the 105 members in the Alabama, Alabama House of Representatives, there are only 28 Democrats, that's it. Um, but I will tell you about all 27 others of those Democrats when it comes to me. If I'm in a fight and I'm in a foxhole, I want to be with one of these 27 other members of the Alabama legislature. So thank you, Representative Warren. As I said, you all know she's a fighter. All of my colleagues are a fighter. As you can see, there's so much important work to be done in the state of Alabama. We will continue whenever possible to reach across the aisle to work together with our Republican colleagues. However, we remain committed to the legislative agenda and priorities we set at the beginning of session. As I mentioned earlier, we simply believe that there are more pressing issues facing Alabama than trying to determine if the sweet potato should be our official vegetable. One of these more pressing issues is the current controversy surrounding Confederate monuments in the state of Alabama. Alabama House Democrats stand strong in our belief that diversity is our greatest strength and that it is time to move forward a more just and equitable future for our state and for our children. We strongly believe that symbolic steps such as removing Confederate monuments from our state parks Eliminating the Confederate State Trooper patch and abolishing state sanctioned celebrations of Confederate holidays are necessary to promote equality, inclusion, and healing. Racism has no place in Alabama. And many of these obvious actions, like prohibiting the National Guard from using Confederate medals on their uniforms are long overdue. Equally important are more substantive measures like common sense le legislation to track traffic stops, to eliminate racial profiling, and help ensure that all citizens are treated justly and fairly by law enforcement. That is why we remain opposed to bills like House Bill 242 sponsored by Representative Holmes, which would impose unreasonable fines on municipalities and public officials 
who remove Confederate monuments based on what the people in their communities want. This is simply a bad bill and it states, no historically significant building or memorial building that is located on public property may be relocated, removed, altered, renamed, dishonored, or disparaged. It just doesn't make any sense, especially in 2021. It doesn't make any sense anymore. And it does nothing but exasperate racial tensions and division. There will be a public hearing on this bill today at 3 p.m. in the State House in room 206. And we hope that people will attend and have their voices heard. This isn't about erasing history or cancel culture. This is fundamentally about respect and about moving past Alabama's painful history of systemic racism and inequality. Simply put, we don't need a statue of a Confederate general next to the courthouse to teach our children about the terrible history of slavery and the horrors of the Civil War and its aftermath. Last time I checked, we still had libraries. Our public monuments should be uplifting and bring us together as a community. These monuments to the Confederacy are simply uh, offensive and their removal will help Alabama heal and move forward. We believe that healing and moving forward centers on finding practical solutions without abandoning our principles. Healing and moving forward is about achieving tangible results for all of the citizens of Alabama. As we close, we will not lose focus on our priorities of health care, voting rights, education, economic growth and business development, criminal justice reform, social justice and police accountability. So as we continue the remainder of this session, we will continue to put the hardworking people of Alabama first and continue to fight for a healthier, more inclusive and more prosperous Alabama. As we've said many times before, the Alabama House Democratic Caucus has only one priority and that's the people of Alabama, that's you. At this time, if there are any questions, we will take those questions, but again, I must say, we, Alabama House Democrats, have one priority, and that is the people of the state of Alabama. We have three questions that have come in from journalists via the Zoom link. The first one says, since you mentioned Medicaid expansion, have the Republicans expressed any interest in moving this forward given the new federal stimulus money? The question is specifically about if uh, Republicans have expressed any interest in moving the, uh, Medicaid uh, expansion forward. Yesterday, many of my colleagues can actually come in as well. Um, yesterday, we did have some discussion about uh, Representative Mary Moore's um, bill coming up on the calendar so we can have real dialogue about it. Of course, there's an opportunity with this federal money to bring that down. I think it would be irresponsible for us not to bring those federal dollars down. So as of yesterday, we are hearing that there is some interest in having those discussions. Anybody else want to comment? I'm going to put my mask on. I want to say this, and I want to say it because it is most of the time the Republicans are talking about the cost. It's going to cost too much. Now we want to build three prisons. And no one is saying anything about the cost from the Republican side. It's going to cost too much. And, and, and old prisons are going to be private operated prisons. So when it comes to people in health care, there's no dollar sign you can put on it because whose life is, 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 is less than a dollar? I want to say this. All our lives are more. That's right. And we should have the value of having the compassion to want to enhance those persons' lives who are less fortunate than ourselves. This state will never grow until we bring those who are poor to the point where they can be competitive and productive. Thank you. That's our preacher right there. I think one of the most misleading things about Medicaid has been that it is a program for minorities. I'm here today to say that the largest number of recipients on Medicaid are not minorities. And this is where we're going to have to, again, put down the partisan politics 
and put the people first. I'm saying thank you. Because it's not a partisan issue. It's the next question. The next question is, um, I'm confused about the monument still. Was there more than one? Why is this still an issue? Yeah, sure. and anybody also can come. There were actually more than one. One of our colleagues, Representative Wanda Levan, actually had a bill, a great bill, great substitute bill, uh, that was gonna restructure how the, the original bill was written. Um, it was going to put this commission together where um, if folks wanted to move it, you can move to museums. Um, matter of fact, I served on judiciary, many of the Republicans actually liked the bill as well because the argument was this, there are communities that actually want them gone. If you want them and you believe in the history, let's move it to you. Let you have, so yes, there is more than one um, monuments bill. Hers was to restructure it. It could not make it out of the uh, Judiciary Committee, but she's refiled that bill. Now, what we were talking about today is a bill that Representative Holmes has, I believe, um, who's also on Judiciary, that, that actually is gonna create those fines for folks that move up the fines, actually, for anybody who wants to move those monuments. Okay. Last question. What are representatives' reaction to the gambling bill passing the Senate Tuesday? And what is the House appetite for a comprehensive gambling bill that includes casinos? I actually am going to defer this. So folks don't know, come on. <laughs> Representative Warren is like our resident gaming expert, served on a lot of the national gaming commissions. And so I want her really to answer that question. Well, I can say we're glad that we've gotten to this point. The problem is at this point, we don't know what we've gotten to. We're gonna to have to get the bill in um, the house. It's gonna to have to go to committees so that we can see. But it's my understanding, and I think it's my personal opinion, that a comprehensive state controlled gaming law is needed in the state of Alabama. The biggest mistake we made in the state for gaming was we start allowing local legislation for gaming, where you can do this in this county, do that in that county. Everybody needs to be doing the same thing. So in a, a comprehensive bill, you will be dealing with lotteries, casinos, and sports gaming. And everybody knows that Alabama pours out millions every year to our surrounding states. So it's now time that we come together and work out a bill, really a nonpartisan bill that we can all live by. Everybody, and, and to be honest with you, you can't make Alabama a Las Vegas. Any good state will limit the number of facilities. They try to have them in different locations, but we cannot open the door to just big time gaming in every county in the state of Alabama. Okay. And, and the only thing that I would add at, at this point is that we have not seen the version of it in the house. Yeah, We've got to be able to read it. But we do know as a caucus that what we're hearing from our constituents is they want the revenue to be tied to Medicaid and to education. And so those things have to happen also in order for it to be successful um, for what the people of the, of the state of Alabama want. And to make sure we, we, we don't leave this out, no matter what we do here as legislators, the people will have the final vote. Is that correct? Yeah. Those are all the questions. Any questions? So, so any questions from our people that are present? Well, at that, this time we will close out our press conference. Um, we're going to be doing these weekly. So to give you the updates, and we need to do this weekly to give you the updates. I've noticed since COVID, we used to have a lot of media that were here in town and they got a chance to see us play by play, week by week. And so we can't do that now. So we want to make sure as Alabama House Democrats that our people back home, the people of the state of Alabama, know the issues firsthand that we're working on. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you next week.